the impulse to keep a memento of a departed person is both ancient and profound. Even the smallest thing can generate a powerful emotional connection. It might be a connection to someone you've known personally, perhaps even a celebrity. But it could also be a connection to a saint who has the power to protect and heal you. Spiritual power that might still be present in a fragment of fabric they once wore, or even in their physical remains. They were known as relics, and for centuries they lay at the center of Christian devotion. They were held to work miracles, and they defined the relationship between Christians and their God. The relics themselves were kept in reliquaries, containers crafted from the most precious materials, so as to express the value of what was inside. Wow. Poised between death and the hope for eternal life, the reliquary is a brilliantly vivid, yet largely forgotten art form. I believe it deserves to be brought out of the darkness of neglect and into the light. The history of relics and reliquaries is a 2,000 year story rooted in the deepest human longings and fears and reflected in some of the richest, most enthralling, yet also hidden away works of art ever created. The murder of Archbishop Thomas Becket in 1170 is one of the most infamous moments in British history. Becket had defied the will of the King, Henry II of England, and he was killed inside Canterbury Cathedral by four knights who'd taken it upon themselves to rid their monarch of this contemptuous, low-born cleric. Beckett died in this space, on this spot. And we're told that his head was cleaved open by the blow of a sword. And for good measure, one of the knight's party, Hugh of Horsier, planted his foot on the martyr's neck and used the tip of his sword to scoop some of his brains out onto the cathedral floor. The murder made Beckett a martyr. Within three years, he was made a saint. And such was the number of pilgrims to his tomb that in 1220, St. Thomas's body was placed in a shrine behind the main altar. Now, this candle marks the spot where Beckett's shrine once stood. Apparently it had a stone pillared base and was capped by a painted wooden canopy suspended from that ceiling boss. But within, within there was a gold-plated casket decorated with sapphires and rubies, diamonds, emeralds and pearls. And it contained Beckett's remains. The shrine was an intoxicatingly rich object designed to awe and amaze, and it had an electrifying effect on the pilgrims of the Middle Ages. They flocked to Canterbury in their hundreds of thousands and established Beckett as England's very first truly international saint. These are the miracle windows. They were installed at the same time as Beckett's shrine, and they describe the early history of his remains. Now, 
right at the bottom of the window, we've got this very precious record of the original appearance of Beckett's tomb. And if you look closely, you can see that there are these two oval pinkish shapes that have been cut into the stone side of that tomb. Now, that was so that the people at large could actually reach into it with their hands and touch the coffin within, the idea being that that act of touching might in some way help them or heal them. And indeed, all around, you've got these images of people who have indeed been healed of all kinds of ailments um, by the miraculous transformative power of the saints' remains. Sir Thomas's shrine was destroyed in 1538 during the Reformation on the orders of Henry VIII. His bones were burned and the ashes scattered. But nearly 500 years later, you can still find two Becket relics in Canterbury. They're here, in a small chapel at the Catholic Church of St. Thomas. This modern reliquary contains two relics of Thomas Beckett, a shard of bone and a tiny piece of blood-stained vestment. Now, they survived the destruction of his shrine because in the early 1200s they were sent abroad as part of a drive to extend the scope of his spiritual influence across Christendom. And they were only returned to this country in the last century when they were donated to this church. The bone came from a religious foundation in Belgium and the vestment came from Italy. And if these really are authentic relics of Thomas Beckett, then they're objects of extraordinary historical importance. But it's only when you really get up close to them, as I am now, that I think you can feel the sheer amount of faith that's been invested in these fragments. To those who really believe the spirit of Beckett himself is still alive there. That is holy matter, the most precious thing of all. To see how blood and bones came to be imbued with such significance, you have to go back to the first century after Christ's death, when there were no churches and Christians were brutally tortured and executed for their beliefs. The only way to keep the faith alive was for Christians to mimic the Roman practice of honouring the dead by gathering at their tombs on feast days. The early Christians inherited this Roman and relatively new veneration of the dead, but they gave it their own twist. You have to remember that theirs was a proscribed religion, a persecuted religion. They had to bury their dead. They had to venerate their ancestors in secret. And in a sense, down in the catacombs, as they did so, that was all they had. They only had the bones of their of their forefathers, the early Christian martyrs' relics, and their faith, and that was it. And I think that combination of circumstances explains why the relic, through the centuries for Christians, has had such a deep, primal power. By the time the Roman Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity in the 4th century, the idea that relics provided a direct link to the saints in heaven was a core belief. And over the next thousand years, the reliquary developed into a sophisticated art form, so that by medieval times, it had become a type of sculpture that very precisely reflected the nature of the relics inside. So, a few fragments of skull would be contained in a head reliquary. Or, in this case, 
pieces of bone from the saint's hand or arm would have been visible through these tiny windows. I've come here to meet Sister Wendy Beckett, who has a deep knowledge of relics and reliquaries, and a deep emotional attachment to them. How do you think the, the power of the relic is expressed by the splendor of the reliquary? The glory of the container is meant to show the glory of the saint. So that was the first desire, something beautiful to show what it means to love God, and if possible, to get in something about the life of the saint. So here, for example, we seem to have a Catherine relic, because there's Catherine with her Catherine wheel. It's almost like a story box. It is a story. There's St. Catherine, whose relics are said to be in here at the top, holding her wheel so insouciantly, you know, spinning it round almost. <laughs> and then round are the stories of her life. Here you have the famous story of how, as a young girl, Our Lady appeared with the child Jesus who put a ring on her finger. And from then on, she wanted to be a virgin dedicated to him. So when the emperor fell in love with her, Catherine said no. So he brings 50 pagan philosophers to talk her down. And she talks them down, converts the whole 50 who are then promptly beheaded. And then they show St. Catherine being beheaded herself. She was originally going to be ripped apart by a wheel. Mm. God struck it with a yes. thunderbolt, didn't yes. he? But inside this, presumably there would have been, or perhaps there still is, uh, one of her bones. What they would have thought was one of her bones. What they would have thought. I think with these very early saints, it's almost impossible that they are the real bones. But they stand in for the real bones. But what is it that it makes you feel? It makes you aware of God's transforming love. Because we don't make ourselves saints, we're made saints by God. We simply have to say yes. So when you're near a relic of somebody who did say that yes, you feel a great wave of encouragement that you too might be drawn into holiness. It's something that you should live up to? Yes, yes. I think this has to be the star reliquary of all here in the V&A. Just amazing. To me, this is the apotheosis of all reliquaries. This is what they all wanted to be. Gleamingly beautiful. A complete work of art. And yet, showing the story of the saint. Because as you know, St. Sebastian was not only shot with arrows because of his Christianity. He was shot by his own regiment his fellow soldiers. And that's why I think, although he was wounded, he wasn't actually killed. The officer probably thought he was killed and marched off having done his job, but he'd just been gravely wounded. And then St. Irene came and took the body away and brought him back to health, just in time for him to be clubbed to death and thrown into the sewer. So this is not his martyrdom, but a stage on his martyrdom. And apart from being a miraculous work of art, we have the intimacy of knowing that within that work of art are relics of the saint. They think they might be little pieces from the arrows, which seems to me most unlikely. It's a little window at the back, isn't it, with yes. little pieces of wood? But those little pieces of wood symbolize what killed him. They are, they are holy in their, in their meaning, if, if not in their actuality. There's such a strong sense of suffering and torture expressed in this, in this image. Was that sense of the master's suffering very important to people's perceptions of their holiness? Well, not all saints suffered physically. But I think it was important to people in their own lives, because we're all very aware of pain at one level or another. And to see a saint being tortured and rising above it like that. That must have mattered a great deal. But of course we actually know why this was made. It was made because there was plague at the monastery. 
And so the abbot commissions St. Sebastian, who's one of the patron saints of health in time of plague, and it was all those wounds, you see, that plague brought to people. Like plague sores? Yes. Also, of course, they were hoping that he would avert the plague from them. So it's rare to know exactly why a reliquary was made. And it's such a magnificent one, so you couldn't have a more wonderful image of what it means to be a saint and to suffer for God. Another reason for making reliquaries so alluring and for making relics so visible was to attract pilgrims whose donations sustained the church. And medieval churches did compete with each other in this way. But relics were central to the daily business of the church in more than just financial terms. As early as the 8th century, the Vatican decreed that every altar must contain relics in order to be consecrated. James Robinson is curating a major exhibition of medieval reliquaries at the British Museum. And among the objects that will be on view is a rare, perfectly preserved example of the importance of relics in the act of worship. So, what exactly is this magnificent object? Well, this is one of the museum's great masterpieces. It's a very rich, visually rich and exciting object with this wonderful combination of ivory, painted vellum, gilt copper. What was its function? It's a, a portable altar. It dates from around the years, uh, around 1200, um, and it's from Hildesheim in Lower Saxony in Germany. And this altar stone in the center is designed to take the footprint of a chalice. In certain contexts, um, mass or, or communion, uh, the Eucharist, might need to be celebrated outside of the confines of a consecrated church and objects like this took the power of consecration with it so it could be used on pilgrimage in the battlefield. I was going to say, um, so, so, so that if, if, if the emperor is going to war against the infidel, mm -hmm. on the morning of the battle he can take communion Absolutely. and he will be filled with the power mm -hmm. of God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, um, so that's really why it's such a densely powerful object. You know. But what's beneath the stone? Beneath the stone, there are relics of some 40 saints. 40 saints? 40 saints, yeah. So it is quite a, it's an incredibly powerful object for that reason. So how long has the museum owned this? It's an extraordinary thing. It was acquired in 1902. Um, and did you know from the beginning, did the museum know that it contained all these relics? I think we probably suspected that it did, but we didn't open it until the late 70s, early 80s. Have you seen the contents taken out? Um, I haven't seen the contents taken out. This will be the first time that I see them taken out. So are you looking forward to it? I'm looking forward to it very much, yes. <laughs> I can't wait. I didn't imagine that they'd all be sort of scrunched up together in that way. I thought it was going to be sort of more... It's know, a very compact arrangement, yes. Yeah. Um, it's like you couldn't get another one in there. You're starting with the relics of St. Gotthard. I have to say, he's not, he's not one of my <laughs> saints that I know about. He's connected very closely to the history of Hildesheim, which is where this portable altar was made. When was he canonised? He's active um, in the late 10th uh, um, and perhaps the first quarter of the 11th century, and he's canonised shortly after his death um, within the 11th century. So um, it's a recent history in terms of the manufacture of this altar piece. That all suggests to me that it's probably very likely that those really are the remains of, of the real Gotthard in that bundle. He's a, he's a local saint, Absolutely. relatively recent. Yeah. This particular relic is supposed to be a tiny fragment of bone. Gosh, there it is. It looks yeah. like what it purports to be, doesn't it?
Conservator Nicole Road, whose job it is to check the condition of each of these fragile bundles, turns next to the relic of a rather more famous saint, Saint John the Evangelist. What do you think you're going to find inside? I believe there's a number of strands of hair inside this bundle. There we go. And the hair is surprisingly quite bright, quite yellow. But it's the same colour as the hair of St John the Evangelist in Leonardo's Last Supper. He's, he's the most angelic, angelic. Yeah. yeah. absolutely. And the favourite, he's Christ's favourite. In all those depictions of the Last Supper, John has got his head on the shoulder of Christ. So that hair would have actually touched Christ. Mm -hmm. It would be almost yet more imbued. Absolutely. What a wonderful thought. I suppose the first question a, a sceptical modern viewer will have is, is this really the hair of John the Evangelist? But I rather like the idea that John the Evangelist is said to have had blonde hair. And, hey Presto, you open the bundle after how many hundreds of years and the hair is blonde. So, there's room for faith. There's room for faith, absolutely. Wow. As objects of faith, the relics of saints were among the most precious things in the medieval world. But they weren't quite the most precious. There was one kind of relic that was even more highly prized and even more powerful. To worship the relic of a saint is to approach the realm of the sacred but what if you could venerate, perhaps even touch, a relic of Jesus Christ himself? According to the Bible, Christ's body ascended directly, miraculously to heaven, but there are nonetheless relics associated with him, and that's why I'm here in Paris, because here they hold the holiest of all those remains. <laughs> At Notre Dame Cathedral on the first Friday of every month, a remarkable service takes place. The veneration of the crown of thorns. The actual crown of thorns, it's believed, that was placed on Christ's head at the time of his crucifixion. Around 3,000 worshippers attend this service every month. Many travel from abroad in an act of modern-day pilgrimage. The Crown of Thorns relic has been in Paris for nearly 800 years, but not always in Notre Dame. It was originally housed here, at the Sainte-Chapelle, the private church of the wealthiest and most pious king in all of Christendom, Louis IX of France. Now, I've been told if you want to experience the full impact of the Sainte-Chapelle, you've got to come here horribly early in the morning, just as the sun is beginning to rise on your own. And that, amazingly enough, is what I've been allowed to do. I mean, it is completely stunning. And the Sainte Chapelle has often been described as the single most beautiful medieval building in the world. But it's only if you come now, I think, that you really do appreciate quite how this building works. It's a space that is meant to be just light and colour. Almost no sense of structure at all. A building that has dissolved into light and colour these great walls of stained glass windows which tell the whole story of the Bible.
And if you look at those windows through half-closed eyes and you look at them almost in an abstract sense, you get this intense blue and these vivid drops of red. It's almost like looking into a sky flecked with blood. And I think that symbolism is actually very important. I think it takes you to the heart of what this building was for. Many people who visit this place don't actually know that it's, it's not a cathedral, it's not really a chapel in a conventional sense. It's a gigantic reliquary box. King Louis had this entire building constructed as a setting for the crown of thorns. It's an astonishing statement of earthly and divine power. Emily Gerry has made a study of the art of the Sainte-Chapelle. Hi, Emily. Hi, nice what to see you. What a fantastic space, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's I feel like we're eating colour when we're in here. So, Emily, how did Louis actually acquire this famous relic, the Crown of Thorns? Well, his cousin, who is the Latin Emperor of Byzantium, named Baldwin, he wrote Louis in 1238 saying, I'm in big trouble, um, I, our, our empire is being invaded, we're in need of money, we're in need of an army, can you help us? And by the way, the, the relics in my imperial collection are, need someone to take care of them. So Louis immediately dispatched somewhere in the realm of 140,000 livres. That's equivalent to half of his annual income as one of the wealthiest rulers in Christendom. So that's half of the entire annual national budget of France. Of France, yes. So the Crown of Thorns relic was then given by Baldwin to Louis as an offering of thanksgiving for his assistance. Wow. So it's a gift because the sale of relics is technically illegal. Louis did not purchase the crown of thorns, he acquired it. And um, here we have the story in glass. This is window A, it's the history of the passion relics. You can see in the second lancet over, that's Louis reacting to seeing the crown for the first time. And when Louis first saw the relic, um, he was overcome with tears. And here in the stained glass windows, the crown of thorns is actually painted green. Uh, it's a living crown, it would have kind of, it's still growing in a way. So when the relic arrives in France from Constantinople, what kind of ceremony does Louis devise to mark its arrival into the city? Uh, if you just crane your neck a bit, the very top it shows that the ceremony of Louis carrying the crown of thorns in its reliquary with his brother Robert of Artois. And they march through the streets in August of 1239 and the adoring public come to welcome the king and his crown. And um, not only the people are there, but also clerics are invited to bring out the relics of Parisian saints to um, bow to Christ's relic, in effect, welcoming Christ to Paris. And he's barefoot. He's barefoot here. Which is um, a great statement for a king to be barefoot. It's humility. Yes, and you're, because you're in the presence of God himself. Yeah. And what does he actually do with it? I mean, other than house it, venerate it? What he did um, was he gave bits um, that were thorns of the crown to uh, missionaries, to other rulers, to diplomats. So he would actually break thorns off the crown? Yes, That's and... That's an amazing thing, because you'd is. think that this is such a precious object, he'd want to keep it intact, but he's actually... It's the best way he could express his, his thanks as a king to those who helped him, was to give him a bit of the, the thing that mattered most to him, that is the crown of thorns. One of the few surviving thorns given away by Louis IX is now in the British Museum, concealed within a beautiful and intricate locket. So James, how is this intriguing little object catalogued in the collections of the British Museum? It's catalogued as a pendant reliquary of the Holy Thorn. Um, so it's actually one of the most precious jewels we have, not so much because of the external surface of it, which is amethyst and gold, but because of what it contains inside. It's secured in place by these two small pins, and I'm going to take them out now so you can get some sense of just how beautiful it is inside. Then it opens rather like a miniature altar piece, oh, good and that's the first face of it. That's so extraordinary. See. It's decorated with translucent enamel laid in shallow fields, it's known as bas thai. What's the decoration? 
the top you can see there's a virgin and child yeah. um, with two angels. And at the bottom there's um, an image of a king and queen. Now based on the date of the enamels, which we date to about 1340, we can deduce that this is probably Philippe VI and his wife, Jeanne de Bourgogne. And the king, barefoot, in imitation of St. Louis. So it's almost like a mini Saint Chapelle. It's like a mini Saint Chapelle. Oh, amazing. Of course, this translucent enamel looks rather like stained glass. That's just fantastic. But the real secret, in fact, the real mystery of the object is contained beneath this panel that shows the nativity. Beneath the vellum? Absolutely. And with so, the, as it were, it's in the middle? Yes. If I do this... And there you have the relic. So in the centre, you see a thorn from the Holy Crown of Thorns. What an amazing object! The design of the jewellery suggests that this was a very, very intimate feeling object. Yes. Yeah, this is something that somebody perhaps carried on their person. Well, when it's closed, uh, you'll, you see it's not something that would be easily worn. Now, the chain isn't original, but I think it replicates the original arrangement, rather like a security strap on a camera. I think it was worn around the wrist. And why is it an amethyst? Most jewels in the Middle Ages were used for their magical medicinal properties. The amethyst is invoked you know, to prevent drunkenness, gout, to staunch the flow of blood in situations like childbirth. If you handle it, and by all means pick it up, Andrew, you'll see it's, it's immensely tactile, you know. It fits into the fist of your hand in a way. You know, well, if you, you clench your hand around that, you'll see. Um, and in a way, that's how I feel the power of the relic was invoked. It's through clutching it in that way. Yes, no, I know what you mean. It, you sort of feel... I can imagine that you could feel that there was something almost just going through you, like mm -hmm. electricity yeah. from that. I think it, its power was probably invoked on very special occasions and my personal belief is that it may have been used as a birth amulet by Jean de Bourgogne. Oh, yes. It, it's held ah, you just sent the shiver up the, off the back of my neck because I think that's exactly right, yeah. You're giving birth. Birth is all about blood. I mean, that's how you might die when you bleed to death. So what do you hold? An object associated with the holy blood. And I think that also makes perfect sense of this arrangement. Mm -hmm. Because if you are a woman in the throes of childbirth, holding on to this thing for dear life in the hope that it might save you... Mm -hmm. You don't want it to slip. You don't want it to slip. And also, you're very liable to lose control. Yes. Yeah. Oh, thank you. That's brilliant. So what I'd taken for a splendid locket to be worn around the neck turned out to be something far more magical a handheld charm. And if this was indeed the birth amulet of Jeanne de Bourgogne, she must have been in desperate need of its power. Three of her seven children died in early infancy. But this unique pendant isn't the only reliquary in the British Museum connected to the Crown of Thorns. The other, known simply as the Holy Thorn Reliquary, is possibly the single most remarkable object to have come down to us from the Middle Ages. Neil McGregor, director of the British Museum, considers it one of the masterpieces of world art. So Neil, tell me how you would go about reading this object. I think this object is, is a theatre. It's a theatre in which the great drama, the most important drama in any Christian's life, is going to be played out. And that's the moment when the dead rise at the Last Judgment. The angels are sounding the last trumpet around the bottom, and the dead are coming out of their coffins. And on this wonderful green hillside, you can see two men, two women, in enamel, coming out of their coffins. And what they know is going to happen next, is judgment. They look up and there at the top is God the Father, the judge. And the only thing that's going to save you because you've sinned is the redeeming blood of Christ. And there in the middle is one of the thorns which caused the blood to flow. It gives you a chance of being saved. The stakes couldn't be higher when you're in front of this object. 
Do we know who once owned this? We know from the coat of arms that it belonged to Jean-Luc de Berry, who was the son of the King of France, the brother of the King of France, and he probably had it made in the 1390s in Paris. Paris at that point is the great place in Europe for expensive goldsmith's work, and this is one of the greatest surviving creations of the Paris workshops, because every bit of this is magnificently made. It's not just the gold, it's the enormous elaboration of the enamel figures and then the way that the jewels are deployed. And, of course, the jewels not just beautiful in their colour but also in their meaning because this is an object about the blood of Christ. So the rubies, which symbolise the blood of Christ, are everywhere. Sapphire is, of course, the blue of heaven. The pearls are about the purity of the Virgin and of Christ. So the object is made up of speaking stones. They have a spiritual meaning as well as a physical value. How, how do you think it was actually used? I think you'll probably use it for private prayer. One person just alone with the object, in dialogue with the divine. And if you were Jean Duc de Berry and you were in your last days dying? I think if he knew he was dying, this is what he would want to look at. But it's pretty certain that Jean de Berry himself didn't, because this is made in the 1390s. When he does die in 1416, he's in Paris, the English have invaded and occupied Paris after Agincourt, and almost all his goldsmith work is melted down by the English. So we have to assume that he gave it away as a very grand present. So with this object, we're at the end of the 14th century, but even then, Am I not right in thinking that there was a, a kind of gathering discontent with the very idea of, of relics and with these splendid objects? Not everybody thinks this is a good idea. No, there's obviously always a concern about the connection between wealth and access to God and the, the kind of world where the possession of a relic might give you privileged access is the kind of word in which people question that privilege. And as the Reformation nears, it becomes a stronger and stronger issue. So the storm clouds are gathering over things like this. They are. And when the lightning strikes, particularly in England, it strikes savagely. The Protestant Reformation of the 16th century changed the landscape of faith in this country forever. The Reformation ushered in a bleak and bitter period for those adhering to the old Catholic traditions of worship. Churches were pillaged, stained glass windows were smashed, statues and paintings ripped down. Shrines were desecrated and relics in their thousands were destroyed. But the old impulse to venerate and to cherish the remains of the saints could not be so easily rooted out and it continued in secret and undercover. And if you want to understand that history, largely a concealed history, there's no better place to come than this. At this Jesuit school, they have a remarkable museum. It's a repository of objects from a faith that was suddenly driven underground. Jan Graffius is the curator. Wow. It's a nice space. It really is. Of all the objects here, the most revealing is also the most unassuming. Found in the 19th century, behind a wall in a nearby Catholic home, it had lain undiscovered for more than 200 years, and it's the only one of its kind in the world. So, Jan, tell me, why have you led me to this uh, distinctly enigmatic object, and what is this? Uh, this, this is, uh, the simple answer is that this is a travelling chest used by salesmen of threads and, and you know, peddlers and so on. And what does it contain? It contains everything a Jesuit priest would need to say Mass. Can we open yes, it up? Yes, by all means, yes, yes. I'm sure. 
just put my gloves on. So the outside is, is pony skin and, and wood with these rather lovely handmade nails. Well, at first sight, I can't see anything that suggests that this is a priest's box. Which is quite right, because if you're, if you're wandering around and you're stopped by the authorities and they flick open your chest, the, the last thing that you want them to see is, is what, you know, what you're doing. So what we've got on top here is a lady's bonnet with a sort of linen exterior and a very beautiful pink silk lining. Goodness me. Part of the camouflage. Part of the camouflage. Now, this is interesting. This is, of course, the altar stone. This is consecrated, and, and the crosses here, you can see the remains of wax around them, would once have held the fragments of relics of martyrs, because, again, that was necessary for the, the altar stone to be consecrated. This is a chasuble. And, again, you can see... Gosh. Early 17th century, lovely green damask and some lovely green brocade. And in any really elaborate 17th century vestment, you have beautiful embroideries and so on. And obviously that's not possible here. But they've done a very simple job just by taking the most precious fabric, the brocade, and outlining it with this white silk ribbon. Where do you think this brocade came from? Probably from some merchant's wife's best Sunday dress. So what we have here is a corporal, and the bread was consecrated directly on top of the corporal. What might happen to a priest using this kit if he were to be caught? The, the penalty was, was quite straightforward. Um, you would be tried for treason because it was illegal to be a Catholic priest in England, and then you would be hanged, drawn and quartered. The reasoning behind it was that after the Pope had excommunicated Elizabeth I and thereby liberated Catholics from their natural allegiance to their sovereign, um, a law was passed saying to follow the Pope meant to be, uh, to be a traitor. Mm. And, and treason is a capital offence. And offense. treason is a capital offence. And, that. and that's the end of it. So they were never officially executed for their faith. They were executed for being traitors. So I'm intrigued by this, I don't know how to describe it, reliquary tube. It's sort of a tall cylinder, isn't it, of glass and silver gilt. It contains the rope that tied Edmund Campion down onto the hurdle that dragged him to Tyburn, where he was hanged, drawn and quartered. He and Robert Parsons, who founded our school, came into England in 1580 as the first Jesuit missionaries to go back to their own country to try and minister to the Catholics. And Campion lasted 18 months before he was captured. Like a lot of people, I'm familiar with the phrase hung, drawn and quartered, but I, I don't know actually what's involved. It's probably one of the most unpleasantly painful ways of, of killing somebody. You're dragged behind a horse to execution um, through the mud. You're then hanged, um, but before you die, they cut the rope so that you're only half strangled. And then the executioner castrates you. And then you're slit open from breastbone to lower stomach and you're disemboweled. That's the drawing part. They draw out your entrails. They're then burned in front of you. While you're alive? It, the executions are very skilled in keeping people alive for as long as possible. And then um, your heart is removed. Then your head is cut off. Your body is divided into four pieces. And then the pieces are parboiled to preserve them for longer because they're going to be stuck up around the city to deter people. Oh. It's a public way of displaying the state's disapproval with your actions and a public way of deterring anybody who wishes to follow in your footsteps. One of the most disconcerting body parts to have been preserved and passed down to the museum is kept in this small silver reliquary. If you look, it's inscribed Oculus Dexter. Oculus Dexter? Mm. The right eye. So this actually contains an eye? It does. That is the right eye of the blessed Edward Oldcorn. That is really getting to the grisly end of it's the relic spectrum. quite a powerful, oh. a powerful thing. It is. Can I, may I ask how we come to possess the right eye of Oldcorn? He was hanged, drawn and quartered 
in Worcester in 1606. And you remember I was describing the process, the last part of which is the parboiling. At this point, the eye obviously came out of the socket and was collected by some Catholic brave enough to gather it from the pot. Oh, but, <laughs> so, oh sorry. <laughs> sorry. When I see something like that, I can't help thinking, OK, so the eye, that's the eye that watched the process as he was tortured to death, that watched yes. the entrails that's right. leaving the body, so that, in a sense, I don't know, there's a kind there's of... There's a very tangible link. Um, I have never seen anyone look at this and not be moved, shocked. There is always, there's always a reaction, there's always a human reaction. It's just like a relic of torture. What do you think the, the, the sort of the underlying message that Catholics might have got from these objects would have been? I think that the real comfort that Catholics derived from holding, looking, being near these objects is um, a sense of affinity with the sacrifice of, of the priests who were trying to bring their faith to them and hope for the future. Keep these safe until such a time when this cruelty and, and, and persecution is no longer um, in England. So it's, it's a pledge for the future as much as a, um, a contact with the past. The laws which banned Catholics from worshipping were not repealed until the end of the 18th century. Emancipation led to a revival of the faith. But there was a problem. Where could Catholics congregate? The Church of England had occupied their old places of worship, stripped them of their images and their shrines, so this new generation of Catholics had to make new churches, and this is what they looked like. This is the chapel of St Edmund's College near Ware, and the architect of all this flamboyance was a Catholic convert named A.W.N. Pugin. The Catholic revival caught the wave of the Gothic revival, an architectural movement inspired by the medieval world. It brought rich decoration, bright colour and images of Christ and the saints back into British churches. Rosemary Hill is Pugin's most recent biographer. Rosemary, thank you for coming. What right. a fantastic space. It's a wonderful space. I think it's one of Pugin's best buildings, actually. Um, marked by this huge and beautiful stone rood screen. And the rood screen was one of the things that Pugin was most enthusiastic to revive. R O O D, meaning cross. Rood. Meaning cross, yes, yeah. with the crucified Christ above it. Rood screens existed in medieval churches. They divide the part of the church where the congregation sits from the sanctuary. One of the many ironies of Pugin's career, of course, was that he used all the steam power and technology of the Victorian age to push art and architecture back 300 years. And what he was trying to do here is to recreate the essence of medieval Gothic art. So it's sort of Stevenson's rocket in reverse. Pugin's backward rocket. <laughs> Absolutely. And one of the things that Pugin wanted to do was to remake, if you like, that kind of breach in history that the Reformation had caused. I was very struck looking at this drawing of, you know, the design for, for the chapel here. I mean, okay, yes, it's in monochrome, but having just visited the chapel, I can see all those colours. I can feel that coming through. Do you think that was part of Pugin's ambition, uh, so to speak, to re-enchant sacred space? Certainly, I think there were a lot of people who, by then, were feeling pretty starved by what the English church was offering, which was very square Georgian preaching boxes. It was all about sermons. There was very little, little colour. There was very little emotional warmth. And what was his attitude to relics? Well, he believed in them, um, I think both in a sacred sense and also as romantic objects. So, I mean, I noticed this beautiful reliquary, which is a Pugin design as well, isn't it? Yes, it's a very architectural form, as medieval reliquaries often were. But it is like one of Pugin's buildings. Um, in miniature. 
in the Middle Ages, they were using gold and precious stones to symbolize heaven and eternity. Here, he's using very polished brass and semi-precious stones, crystal. Yes, well, this was the problem for Pugin and indeed for the whole English Catholic community, was that after emancipation, they were like, as one of the bishops said, we're like the first family after the flood. I mean, they hadn't got anything because they hadn't been allowed to build anything. So everything was needed and there was very little money. And uh, Paul Pugin always had to battle against accusations of uh, Brummagen ware, the, the, the very shoddy metalwork that the Victorians churned out of Birmingham. But to be fair to this particular made in Birmingham object, it's actually not half bad, is it? It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. And the detailing, the finishing, is very fine. And the stones they are only semi-precious stones, but they're very beautiful colours and very carefully chosen. And whose are the bones? The bones are of Thomas a Becket. Pugin was a great enthusiast for the English Catholic Church. So in the context of the 1840s, it is a statement of English Catholicism. Pugin was a man of the modern industrial age who deliberately harked back to the medieval past. But the relic and the reliquary can still speak very directly to the present, the traumas of recent history and the desire to heal their wounds. During the 1970s and 80s, a brutal campaign of repression by the military government in El Salvador claimed thousands of lives. The leader of the church, Archbishop Oscar Romero, began to speak out on behalf of the victims and their families. Finally, on the 23rd of March, 1980, he made a direct appeal to the Salvadoran army. Debe de prevalecer. La ley de Dios que dice no matar. Ningún soldado que está obligado a obedecer una orden contra la ley de Dios. The following day, Oscar Romero was shot dead in church while celebrating mass. In the eyes of most Salvadorans, Romero had been martyred, and today he is revered there as a saint, although he's not yet been declared to be one by the Vatican. Romero's body was buried, but his possessions, including the vestments he was wearing when he died, have become modern relics. Jan Graffius, curator at Stonyhurst College, was closely involved in helping to preserve them. So what are the relics and, and what's happened to them? The, the, the main relics are the contents of his tiny little three-room house in the grounds of the hospice where he lived. And in the little back room are the clothes he was wearing when he was shot. What do they look like? Um, well, he was a very simple man, so they're very simple clothes. A simple purple um, chasuble, the semicircular garment that a priest wears when he's saying mass. Very thin cotton. Underneath that, a white alb, which is a floor-length white garment. Are and they very bloodstained? They're very bloodstained. On the, the chasuble, there is a tiny, tiny little hole directly over the heart, um, and no sign of anything else. But when you look at the, the white alb underneath, um, it gives you some idea of the violence of, of his death. Um, it's completely coated in blood. Are they just uh, leaving it completely as it was without touching it? Pretty much. It's now in a position where it, it should be safer um, from the point of view of, of environment. But at the end of my work, I was there over three years, at the end of my work, the sisters presented me with a tiny piece of the blood-soaked alb to take back to Stonyhurst. Um, it lives in this very small jewellery box, which is how it was given to me. Um, and, and inside is just... Goodness. We're in the process of commissioning a reliquary and we've asked Fernando Yort, who's a very famous Salvadoran artist, to design and paint something appropriate. 
So it strikes me that it's an object rather like a folding altarpiece with wings. You've got two angels on the front? We've got the Annunciation on the outside with Gabriel and Mary. Then when you open it up, we have this central painting. And around it, um, I will have painted the readings from the Mass that he was saying when he was murdered. And a quotation from his last sermon, which was spoken seconds before he was shot. The gospel that he was reading was about the grain of wheat that falls to the ground, and unless it dies, it remains a grain. But if it dies, it brings back a rich harvest. He knew he was going to die. Oh, he did, yes, yes. And will this all be coloured? Brightly, brightly coloured. Um, when I was last there, um, I saw in one of the markets this little Christmassy triptych, which I bought for one of my children. Um, this is not by Hjort, but it's very much in his style. In a sense, it's El Salvadorian folk. Very, art. yes. Yes. with these very bright colours. Very strong colours. So that, that gives us a sense of what your reliquary will eventually look like. Yep. Where are you going to keep the relic? It's such a tiny little fragment that what I, what I plan to do is to have a little silver and glass locket which will be fixed permanently underneath the main painting and above it this central figure here. You can see this is Archbishop Romero himself with his hand outstretched holding his heart and at the bottom, the rifle that killed him. And what do you hope it will say to the world? I want it to get some idea of the vibrancy of the culture and the people who Romero was standing up for. I want people to go away and think, who was this man, and learn more about him. And I want them to understand that working for truth and justice and peace has a terrible cost, but that the end of your life is not the end of the struggle. In Stonyhurst College, where it will be displayed, we have many young people who are beginning to learn that the world has much injustice, and I want them to go and find out more, and maybe, in their own small ways, work to promote a more just and peaceful world. When I set off on this journey into the art of the reliquary, I had my own preconceptions. I felt this was very much going to be an exploration of death and religion. And yes, of course, those things are there. I think of that wonderful Holy Thorn reliquary in the British Museum. An object designed for the contemplation of a man in his last days, perhaps fixing his eyes on God. But there's so much else to the art of the reliquary as well. I think of that extraordinary eye of Edward Oldcorn, a thing that speaks so eloquently of a community's determination to survive persecution and oppression. I think of that wonderful silver St. Sebastian reliquary, and I think of a very different community's desire to survive the strike of an epidemic. And perhaps above all, I think of that, of that amazing little birth amulet once held by a woman absolutely determined to give birth to a healthy child. So yes, reliquaries at the literal level speak of death, they contain emblems of death, but I think at the deepest level of all, what they really speak about is life, the passions that move us all as human beings. We're heading off on a Mediterranean voyage with Francesco de Mosto on Thursday this week. His journey from Venice to Istanbul continues at 10.